they would be in Geneva this week at the WTO Public Forum. Um, so while we miss being by the lake, we're delighted to have the opportunity to host a session during Geneva Trade Week. And we thank the organizers for their hard work in, in putting this platform together and for the opportunity to, to host a session this week. Um, so our panel this evening, um, afternoon, morning, <laughs> it, depending on your time zone, is titled From Microchips to Medical Devices, Ensuring the Supply Chain of Essential Goods. Uh, during this panel, our speakers will outline the important role semiconductors play in supporting essential goods and activities during the pandemic, some of the supply chain challenges our industry and, and downstream customers have faced, lessons learned from COVID-19's impact on essential ICT supply chains, and of course, uh, steps policymakers can take to, to strengthen supply chains of essential ICT goods, uh, both now and in the future. Uh, we have three speakers on our panel today. Uh, the first is Mary Thornton, who is the Director of International Trade Policy and Export Controls at Texas Instruments. Uh, she leads the Global Trade Policy and Export Control Portfolio at TI, uh, including China issues, cybersecurity, and supply chains. And prior to joining TI, she worked for the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative uh, in the Industrial Goods and Market Access Division and served as Trade Attaché to the WTO between 2015 and 2018. So she knows Geneva well. Uh, and uh, during her time in Geneva, she was the chief U.S. negotiator for the, the ITA expansion, helping lead the initiative to a successful conclusion. Uh, our next speaker is Mario Palacios, uh, who is a senior managing, uh, senior managing director of international trade policy at Intel Corporation. And Mario has been with Intel for nearly 15 years, years and leads a global team focused on policy and advocacy in all things uh, related to international trade policy from digital trade, export controls, customs, trade facilitation, and supply chain assurance. And our third speaker is Ralph Ives, who's the Executive Vice President of Global Strategy and Analysis at the Advanced Medical Technology Association, or ADMED, where he promotes open market access for medical technology products worldwide. And prior to joining ADMED in 2004, Ralph also worked for the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative, uh, for many years, uh, serving most recently as Assistant U.S. Trade Representative for APEC Affairs uh, and Assistant U.S. Trade Representative for Pharmaceutical Policy. Uh, so those are our three speakers. Uh, before I turn to them for, for their remarks, I'd like to offer um, a brief introduction to SIA and who we are. Uh, so SIA, uh, we represent 95% of the U.S. semiconductor industry by revenue. So as you see, uh, uh, in addition to, to US uh, headquartered companies like Intel and Texas Instruments, we also represent uh, many international chip companies um, and companies in the semiconductor ecosystem as well. And for over 40 years, our role has been to advance policies uh, in Washington and around the world that promote growth and innovation in our industry. Uh, Few people, going to the next slide, few people are aware of the important role that semiconductors play in everyday life and the even more important role that they've been um, playing during the pandemic in supporting essential goods and essential, uh, essential activities. So hear from this slide and we'll hear more from our speakers on the essential nature of semiconductors, but semiconductors are the, the brains behind a wide range of, of devices uh, and infrastructure uh, including healthcare and medical devices, uh, but also telecommunications, transportation, delivery services, digital services, you know, our um, chip support remote uh, work study, the energy grids, agricultural and food distribution, manufacturing, and, and much, much more. Um, so they are, they're quite um, essential uh, in a crisis. They, they enable user input, display, wireless connectivity, uh, processing, storage, power management, and, and other essential functions. Semiconductors are also perhaps one of the most globalized industries in the world with a very complex and uh, sophisticated semiconductor ecosystem. Um, you know, we'd say that a chip crosses borders three or more times, um, starting, you know, from the first stage of production uh, to, where, to when they're finally integrated into an end product. So this is an example of uh, the different stages on how semiconductors are produced. Uh, because the semiconductor supply chain is so highly integrated and globalized, um, semiconductor shortages created by operating restrictions in one region can lead to bottlenecks in other regions. Uh, we experienced this during the COVID crisis, you know, as many countries around the world 
uh, uh, put in place uh, movement restriction orders or lockdown orders, um, you know, whatever you would like to call them, um, that shut down uh, businesses. Uh, and we did experience some disruptions um, in several countries uh, who had shut down, um, shut down factories and shut down other businesses, which had a severe impact on, on some of their supply chains, which um, some of our um, speakers will, will touch on. Um, for this, you know, we did a, a survey of SI member companies back in March and found that 83% uh, of our surveyed firms face disruptions in operations, research, and development as a result of the coronavirus, primarily due to the government ordered closures of facilities. Uh, and this has had an impact on the supply chain of essential goods and ICT goods. Um, so today our speakers will kind of highlight this story of, of uh, you know, highlight the important role semiconductors play, uh, the importance of prioritizing uh, semiconductor operations um, to support uh, the manufacture and, and operations of other essential goods like medical devices, and then they'll offer also offer some um, lessons learned and, and recommendations for policymakers uh, to support uh, open and connected uh, supply chains of essential ICT goods. So with that, I'll turn to our first speaker, uh, Mary Thornton, um, and I believe the organizers will hand her control. Great, Mary, when you're ready, to control. Control. great. Okay. Um, thanks very much, Davey, for uh, the introduction. Um, I'd like to start by uh, thanking the Geneva Trade Platform for hosting this event, uh, the Semiconductor Industry Association for inviting me to speak on this panel representing Texas Instruments, and of course, a thanks to everyone who is attending this panel. Um, while I wish we could be meeting in person in Geneva, uh, it is a testament to the power of technology that we're all able to join this session virtually from our homes and offices around the world. Um, I'll begin my, mark, my remarks by introducing Texas Instruments, or TI. Uh, we are a global semiconductor company that designs, manufactures, tests, and sells analog and embedded processing chips. For decades, we have operated with a passion to create a better world by making electronics more affordable through semiconductors. Our chips help designers in every technology market make their electronics more intelligent, unlocking new possibilities for products. Each generation of innovation builds on the last to make technology smaller, more efficient, more reliable, more affordable, and therefore more accessible to all people, making it possible for semiconductors to go into electronics anywhere. You probably don't realize how many semiconductors are in your life every day. Think for a minute about all the encounters you have with electronic devices, from your smartphone to your car, to the electronic gadgets you use to listen to music, watch movies, play games, and to the machines that diagnose and treat illnesses when you visit a healthcare facility. Each of those devices incorporates semiconductor chips and technology. Semiconductors are indeed all around us. Uh, next, I'd like to share a little bit about TI's global footprint and our supply chain. We employ 30,000 people in more than 30 different countries. We have major design sites in India, the United States, Germany, China, Taiwan, and Japan. We manufacture chips in 14 TI-owned and operated manufacturing sites in the Americas, Europe, and across Asia. These include 10 front-end fabrication facilities where semiconductor wafers are manufactured, as well as seven assembly and test factories and multiple bump and probe facilities where those wafers are diced, packaged, and tested. And we have more than 120 sales and application uh, sites across the globe. Every year, TI sells tens of billions of chips globally. The typical chip travels thousands of miles crosses several borders and is subject to the trade policies and domestic regulations in each country that it enters. So as you can imagine, uh, open trade and market access policies are essential to enable business growth, growth, promote fair competition, and allow the semiconductor industry to maintain an efficient supply chain. Given that I'm presenting at Geneva Trade Week and we have uh, presumably trade aficionados in the audience, I wanted to point out that every country where TI operates a manufacturing site or has a distribution center is either a party to the World Trade Organization Information Technology Agreement, 
or a party to a free trade agreement with the United States. TI has benefited immensely from the tariff-free trading environment created by the ITA, which played a significant role in enabling semiconductor supply chains around the world. But having a global supply chain means that when a global pandemic like COVID hits, operating restrictions and regulatory barriers in one region impact the entire supply chain. Given the essential nature of semiconductors as a key enabling technology of electronic products critical to virtually all sectors of the economy, disruptions in the semiconductor supply chain create a ripple effect which can impact the availability and continuity of supply for critical goods necessary to combat the COVID-19 pandemic. Semiconductors are a key component in life-saving healthcare and medical devices. For TI, the five key areas in the medical sector that we serve are medical equipment, patient monitoring and diagnostics, home healthcare, imaging, and personal care and fitness. Our customers around the world have seen demand soar for multiple technologies on the front lines of the COVID-19 response, including ventilators, oxygen concentrators, infrared thermometers, CT scanners, patient monitoring devices, and much more. Whether it's prevention, diagnosis, or treatment applications, our focus has been on getting TI semiconductor products and technologies to our medical devices customers quickly so that they can get their life-saving equipment to the medical facilities and frontline workers that need them. I'll give you just a few examples of the solutions that TI is uh, supporting to fight the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, as chest x-rays emerged as a frontline diagnostic imaging test for the virus, one biomedical electronics company in Shenzhen, China, needed help with emergency production of its equipment. Our company reacted fast to meet the increased demand, coordinating internal production and prioritizing the need. The customer's medical equipment was manufactured and delivered quickly to hospitals in the areas hardest hit by COVID-19 in China and Italy. For hospitals taking careful measures to limit virus exposure at their facilities, patient monitoring technology is a game changer. One of TI's customers developed a single patient use wearable technology that tracks respiratory illness anywhere. The device leverages a tiny embedded semiconductor chip and snaps into a wristband to process vital sign data while patients shelter at home. TI helped our customer fast track production of their device so that it could be used to monitor patients with mild cases of the virus. As governments develop and implement plans to reopen their economies, our customers have looked to TI's millimeter wave radar technology to develop mass screening devices. The solution is designed to check hundreds of people per hour for virus symptoms. The sensor can quickly detect basic vital signs that could indicate illness, including heart rate and breathing rate. TI's connectivity solutions are also being used to better coordinate patient care. Transferring data through reliable, securely enabled wireless connectivity allows medical professionals to quickly evaluate and diagnose a patient's condition which is valuable information that could potentially slow the spread of the virus. These are just a few of many examples. For each use case, the faster we get our semiconductor technologies to our customers, the less personal protective equipment and hospital beds will be needed, and the less risk that frontline healthcare workers face. To quote one of our manufacturing planners in the Philippines, we realize that this is not just about meeting our commitment, we are playing a part in this pandemic. Our technology can help the world win this battle. As a company and as an industry, we've been focused throughout this time uh, on ensuring the health and safety of our workers and the continuity of our research design and manufacturing operations. Since the pandemic began months ago, we've worked tirelessly to take all necessary steps following all government guidance continue TI's manufacturing operations so that we can continue serving our customers that produce medical devices and other critical goods. As essential work in our factories and labs continues, 
We've adapted our operations in response to the pandemic, working closely with governments in the locations where we operate. TI has implemented several preventive measures at all sites, including health and temperate screenings, increased cleaning protocols, providing and requiring face masks, and social distancing protocols. But obviously there's only so much that we as a company and as an industry can do to adapt our operations and our value chains to manage, manage this unprecedented situation. COVID-19 exposed unique challenges facing the electronic supply chain where operating restrictions and regulatory barriers, as I said, uh, in one region, create disruptions and shortages that ripple through the global supply chain, not just for semiconductors, but for critical goods. So what are some of the lessons we learned and what can governments do to facilitate business continuity and minimize those supply chain disruptions going forward? I'd like to offer a few recommendations. First, as governments around the world continue to adjust strategies to recover from and respond to the current pandemic, as well as formulate policies to respond to future global public health crises, it is critical that policymakers maintain open and connected supply chains of essential goods, including semiconductors, as part of their crisis response strategies. It was critical in the early weeks, weeks and months of the COVID-19 pandemic for the semiconductor industry and our supply chain operations to be designated as essential business by governments around the world. We were fortunate enough uh, that we were able to work so closely with the governments where we operate and educate them about our role in supply chains of critical products such as ventilators. But even among countries that issued national guidance exempting the ICT and semiconductor industries as essential, there was often diverging guidance and interpretation between national, provincial, and local jurisdictions, as well as backlogged applications for exemptions. This divergence in guidance and interpretation sometimes created an uncertain and uneven operating environment for semiconductor companies, uh, TI included. Uh, we would encourage strong coordination between national governments and local governments to ensure that any necessary registrations for essential business are issued in a timely manner, along with distribution of worker passes. Also, given the global nature of our operations, the ability for key technical personnel and business continuity decision makers to travel across borders is essential to maintaining effective manufacturing operations. And this remains a challenge for us today. So in other words, we look to policymakers to help facilitate the movement of people. From a movement of goods perspective, we look to policymakers to take steps to increase customs capacity with expedited service availability to transport semiconductor and supply chain goods. And of course, eliminating tariffs on essential goods, including medical supply components like semiconductors, will help to lower consumer prices and make electronics and critical goods more accessible to people around the world. So I'd like to thank you all again for the, the opportunity to speak to you all and I'll hand it back to Davey. Thanks so much, Mary, uh, for that presentation um, and for just an overview of, of how this has affected um, TI and recommendations for, for policymakers. Um, so I'll turn next uh, to our next speaker, uh, Mario Palacios with Intel Corporation. Go ahead, Mario. You're still on mute, Mario. Thank you. Uh, and I also would like to take an opportunity to thank uh, the organizers of the Geneva Trade Platform and Geneva Trade Week uh, for the opportunity uh, for SIA to present the, this afternoon uh, to all of you. And I'd also like to thank the Semiconductor Industry Association to, um, for this opportunity as well uh, to address um, this very important forum. And as Mary and, and both Davy have said, uh, I look forward to the opportunity that someday to be in Geneva again and be able to, to address um, the audience in person. Um, before I get started, um, I, do, I do want to uh, talk a little bit about um, and go on about what, what the importance is of these types of medical devices and how these medical devices uh, rely on semiconductors. But before I do that, let me just give you a bit of a background on Intel, Intel Corporation, which Intel's name should not be um, should be all be very familiar to all of you. 
Uh, Intel is one of the leading uh, semiconductor companies in the world. Our, in, our, our processors, memory, and other technologies uh, power the cloud and billions of connected devices in the global uh, digital economy. Our products are the building blocks of our information economy and are instrumental to emerging fields such as in, in artificial intelligence, autonomous vehicles, 5G networks, and as we have seen, and what, we, what we'll, I will speak to a little bit here in the next slide, is healthcare. In today's global environment, Intel and, and other companies in the ICT ecosystem depend heavily on the ability to ship products across international borders quickly and cost effectively. And we saw that um, reliance and importance uh, during the early days of the pandemic and the pandemic response. Uh, Semiconductor products, these, these, these modern technologies power healthcare and medical devices um, across the ecosystem. Just to give you some examples, and you saw a little bit in Mary's presentation, these medical devices are very, very important to the treatment of, uh, of COVID-19, to provide um, triage, to provide treatment, and also very instrumental in, in helping folks recover from COVID-19. Uh, in fact, um, if you if just taking an example and some looking at some of these at some of these devices, for example, CT and P PET, uh, general radiography and fluoroscopy X-rays, uh, interventional uh, and electrophysiology and X-ray equipment, and, and also other mobile C-arm X-ray equipment, all rely on uh, semiconductors classified under 8542.31. I know you didn't expect to hear an HS code in this presentation, but I think for some of you in the audience, you'd appreciate really understanding what type of device we're talking about. And I think Mary touched upon it earlier, but it is very important and we do rely on duty-free treatment, trade facilitation of these types of devices that allow uh, companies, um, uh, medical device manufacturers to obtain this and to, to, to obtain these goods. In, in, in a very quick and cost-effective manner so these items can get to the field very, very quickly. Um, let me move to the next slide. So speaking of uh, coordinated efforts, um, you saw there are many, many moving parts associated with the cross-border trade and global supply chains in our industry. Um, upon the onset of the pandemic, challenges uh, to these supply chains were exacerbated. Uh, global supply chain burdens, delays, uncertainties, all related to the COVID pandemic, really highlighted areas where um, governments and industry had to work together and had to work together very quickly. Um, as mentioned earlier, uh, semiconductors are a foundational, our foundational technology to modern electronics and ICT goods and have played an important role in the public health uh, and addressing the public health emergency globally um, following the, the COVID-19. Because, because of these emergencies and because of these um, uh, uh, potential problems across, this, uh, across the supply chain, industry had to move very quickly. Uh, industry globally, as you see in these two example documents, uh, industry from Korea to Japan to Europe to China, around the world uh, joined together to really un to, to ascertain what global guidance there was to share uh, global or governmental guidance on, on the identification of um, some, the semiconductor industry, its supply chain, the manufacturing supply chain and its workers as essential workers. Uh, we were able to ensure that government uh, guidance was, was shared, was understood by other by, by governments around the world, and 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 what what really occurred was a, a really firm understanding of just the criticality of the industry and the criticality of the items that the industry is producing for the healthcare of of uh, for the healthcare industry as well. Um, consistency in this area was very important uh, in in order to avoid severe disruptions and and certainly ensure that the the supply chain at every every stage of from design to manufacture to fulfillment was uninterrupted and if there were questions that questions could be answered very quickly by by the industry representatives in a particular country in a particular region uh, in an effort to again uh, be able to ensure that the disruptions were minimal and if the disruptions did occur 
uh, the clarifications could be addressed and, and the supply chain could be uh, reopened again. Um, the the I, I will say, and, and just um, it's very important for industry here to work together, to be able to share information, and also for governments to be able to listen to industry and understand just what types of activities were being per permitted in one country and how the industry was taking health measures uh, and, and also ensuring that the health and safety of their workers were also taken into consideration. And lastly, um, I want to talk a little bit further about agreements. Um, trade, the unsung heroes, in addition to those working in the front lines, but certainly for those of us on the policy and regulatory side, uh, these are two fundamental agreements. In fact, I call them pillars uh, of the WTO. And what we saw during the early days of the pandemic, and we continue to still see that, is just how the information technology agreement and the WTO trade, facilita trade facilitation agreement were so instrumental to ensuring that items, goods were being, uh, can, could be um, moved around the world uh, at a very, at, at, in a duty-free treatment uh, with quick market access and barrier-free barrier, barrier free entry. Uh, the trade facilitation agreement, for example, um, a lot of the a lot of the measures uh, identified in that agreement uh, were instrumental in how companies were able to move goods in and out of that of a particular regions. For example, measures like the authorized economic operators, which uh, provide certain additional trade facilitation benefits to these members, uh, really permitted companies who have this status in various parts of the world to be able to move goods quickly, to be able to clear customs before the items arrived in that particular jurisdiction, to answer questions, to be able to ensure authorities, health authorities, customs authorities of just the beneficial nature of these items that also answer the health questions that, um, that uh, many authorities were asking of importers, to be able to ensure that these were low risk uh, to some no risk at all to ensure that all legal requirements were met and items could move through the dock and into warehousing and fulfillment operations very quickly. This idea of streamlined release of goods, the submission of process and processing of customs information prior to arrival at the port was instrumental for the industry. Um, many uh, customs administrations globally, as a result of the, the free trade facilitation agreement, had 24-hour uh, services, had uh, single window capabilities as well to be able to deal with just the immense volume, but also deal with the immense amount of regulatory information that needed to be transacted between importer and government um, during the pandemic. Uh, we and as a result, uh, we were able to move these semiconductors to the 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 um, healthcare companies that were able then to get these items like ventilators uh, to end users quickly. Um, all of that, this paperless, this automated system, expedited the release of goods. But one other key instrument in that release of goods was duty-free treatment. The ITA, those 85, 42, 31 items were duty-free as a result of the ITA. And again, uh, we the, the expedited release of goods was helped because of the duty-free treatment there. You didn't have to transact customs fees and other types of, of taxes. So um, I do want to give those in the audience who work at the WTO, who have been working on these agreements for a very long time, who were, who were instrumental in making these things, these two pillars happen, I want to give you kudos. And, and I do want to give all of us who are in the trade policy and regulatory community information on just how important these items were and just how important we should continue supporting these types of agreements. Because in the future, as pandemics uh, occur again, uh, trade is critical to how we react to these pandemics and how we treat um, and, and how we respond. Um, so with that, um, I thank you and I look forward to um, the presentations that are coming up. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Mario, for that. And and um, yes, you know, I think that you know this current time that you know the WTO um, you know has has been been criticized, but I think it's important to remember that there are a lot of good agreements in place uh, that um, you know kind of in the background, like the TFA, that play a very very important role. And the pandemic could be much worse if we didn't have you know, these expedited um, trade and we didn't have these arrangements in place where we we could move goods across borders. Um, you know, it's a very it's a very clear example um, of the importance of, of the WTO. So thank you for that. Um, and I also uh, kind of wanted to highlight your your comment on the semiconductor clean room operations and and the um, you know the things that companies have done to keep their employees uh, uh, healthy and safe. Uh, I, the semiconductor industry has a very good story there as well. Um, that the you know, semiconductor industry clean room operations. Um, that we operate in a clean environment to, to minimize risk of virus transmission and more has been done. Um, but, uh, you know, for more information on the semiconductor industry and their commitment to keeping uh, workers uh, safe, uh, SIA does have a primer on COVID um, that would direct you to SIA's website for, for more information there. Um, you know, one key stat um, is that, you know, while ambient air in a typical urban area contains, you know, 35 million particles uh, per cubic meter that range um, up to 0.5 micrometers, the high cell clean room will have zero particles of that size. Uh, and the average size of a COVID-19 microbe is 0.125 micrometers. Uh, and the, the highest uh, um, clean room conditions will only have 10 particles per cubic meter in that size of, of less than 0.1. So we operate in very clean conditions, very complex conditions, um, but our our companies are have have gone above and beyond to make sure that their employees have been safe, um, and also getting getting PPE and, and getting essential semiconductors, um, you know, to to their to their suppliers. Um, it's been a very good story to tell. Um, so thanks again, Mario, for for your comments there. I would like now to turn to our last speaker, um, Ralph Ives, um, with Advamed, who can who will talk more specifically um, about uh, the medical device industry um, uh, and and their impact and lessons learned. So um, thanks, Ralph. I'll, I'll turn it to you. Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to participate in SIA's uh, uh, panel on Geneva Week. Like others, uh, um, I spent a great deal of time in Geneva, so I'm um, somewhat disappointed we can't be having this conversation in person, and hopefully uh, in the near future we will. Uh, first, just a brief advertisement about AVAMED, the Advanced Medical Technology Association. We represent over 400 member companies and manufacture a full range of medical devices and diagnostics. We're headquartered in Washington, D.C and have a global presence as our members provide medical technology to virtually uh, patients in virtually every country of the world. Um, Avamed also leads a global alliance of 30 associations representing every region. We're called the Global Medical Technology Alliance with our headquarters in Geneva. So what is medical technology? Many people think of medical technologies as, um, I'm sorry, I should have thanked the other panelists, uh, Mary and Mario. Um, you, you provided an excellent overview in terms of what is a medical device through your uh, describing the importance of ICT and semiconductors. Um, you have many good examples of your products which should help uh, clear up many misconceptions. But I, I, I think uh, we've been lumped so much with pharmaceuticals. Let me just provide a couple of sentences on, um, on, on, on uh, medical technologies. We're not mechanical drugs. Uh, the easiest way to think of medical technologies are basically everything in the hospital, except the people and the pills. Um, and uh, there's uh, roughly two, 2 million medical products, medical devices, according to the World Health Organization. Um, so we're quite uh, diverse. Another key point about um, medical technology is the innovation is very rapid uh, with new medical products replacing current products about every 18 to 24 months. Uh, this is much different from the pharmaceutical model, which uh, tends to rely on lengthy patent terms for new chemical compounds. And as this rapid innovation has been occurring, our industry relies more and more 
on ICT and semiconductors. And this dependence was even more obvious uh, with the challenges of COVID, which Mary and Mario described very well. In the United States and other countries, not only did manufacturing uh, of essential uh, products stop, but clinic, clinics and hospitals are shut down. They basically stopped treating uh, patients other than those with COVID. And patients themselves have been very worried about returning to hospitals as any, uh, for any treatments other than COVID. What this means is uh, in the United States, remote monitoring uh, using many of the devices that were described, ICD, pacemaker, dialysis uh, machines was essential. Telemedicine and other virtual treatments became more of the rule than the exception. And these standards of treatment depend on ICT. Access to ICT components are critical, which became very, very clear during this pandemic. And as Mary, uh, Mary described, um, some of the difficulties our industry faced during the first half of the year centered on shutdowns and trade restrictions imposed by many governments. There were no predetermined rules for what goods and services were essential. These bar barriers were exacerbated by sharp drops in transportation, primarily air transportation, as passenger flying basically stopped, creating huge logistical difficulties. Meanwhile, demand for certain types of medical technologies, personal protective equipment, ventilators, portable x-rays, hemodialysis, diagnostic tests in the US and globally just skyrocketed. And many of these products and the labs that run the diagnostic tests depend on ICT. So localization, how are, how are the United States and other governments reacting to the COVID crisis? The United States experience during COVID has prompted growing concerns about the global supply chains and stronger voices for Buy American. This elicited a multitude of proposed legislation in the U.S. Congress, from the helpful, calling for detailed studies of causes of shortages, to what we view as the hurtful, requirements for more and more Buy American requirements and stringent rules of origin. For example, in August, the president implemented a new Buy American executive order that require the US government to purchase medicines and medical devices essential for public health emergencies from American sources. The Congress might want more. And this issue will not go away even if President Biden wins a presidential election. A recent poll indicated 75% of Americans support by American. And uh, candidate Biden in the uh, debate last night make it very clear he supports by American. Other countries are implementing localization policies as well. The WTO and other organizations have been documenting these programs. For the medical technology industry, just as Mary and Mario described for their, uh, their respective uh, constituents, we want open borders and unrestricted market access to serve patients where they are. We depend on open global supply chains to source critical inputs and components. ABMM members tend to locate regionally. How can governments help? What can governments do to prepare for the next global crisis in a way that discourages trade and internal restrictions? In June, ABMED released a paper we called Principles for Preparedness. It listed four principles, the first of which, including uh, building up stockpiles of critical products, a concept that is now completely non-controversial, widely supported. Second, we suggested ways the government could provide positive incentives to encourage manufacturing in the United States. We're certainly supportive of manufacturing in the U.S., we have uh, uh, some type of plants and presence in nearly every state in the United States, but we also want these incentives to be positive and not causing uh, restrictions. Third, we propose ways to improve internal critical supplies. 
the allocation of those supplies. But our fourth principle, stress the need to keep supply chains open. This, in our view, requires trust. What can governments do in the WTO to restore trust in global supply chains? If governments don't trust their trading partners, we'll likely see more policies aimed at reshoring our localization of manufacturing products in a variety of countries. You may recall that in March, the G20 adopted an extraordinary joint statement endorsing open trade. This is good, but it's not enough. The concept of trusted traders has been bandied about. But what does this mean? So in our, our paper, Principles for Preparedness, we tried to create a little bit more of the uh, a vision for, of what this would entail. The WTO would serve as a platform for forum uh, for plurilateral agreement among governments. The Trade Facilitation Agreement, outstanding ITA, Avamed, and our members participated very much in that. Of course, we support those as foundations. But we think the governments could collaborate even more to avoid future disruptions by agreeing in advance to specific steps to improve supply chains and reduce costs. Such measures could include prohibiting export restrictions, designating in advance the manufacturing facilities to, to be deemed essential and not threaten the closure, implementing even more clear trade facilitation measures to facilitate and expedite medical supplies through the fast track pro process that Mario uh, mentioned, immediately suspending all import tariffs on designated medical technologies among the signatory governments, harmonizing specific regulatory procedures, such as the United States, the FDA used what was called emergency use authorization to expedite um, products through the uh, regulatory process, and finally, designating specific cargo space for medical supplies. The benefits of this agreement will be limited to the, to the signatories of this undertaking. We could use um, provisions of Article 20 of the WTO, which allows certain suspension of obligations, or we could basically say this is not um, unconditional MFN, it is conditional MFN. But I know that is a rather uh, uh, maybe startling uh, um, proposal, but I listened to trade panels in the United States and four former U.S. trade representatives all indicated that unconditional days of unconditional MFN are probably over. Um, we believe also the penalty for non-compliance of this agreement should be more contractual in nature than the dispute settlement process, perhaps including financial penalties on governments for failing to keep predetermined commitments. So this is our uh, specific proposal. And in conclusion, the United States and the world are experiencing an extraordinary traumatic event, but experts warn us that COVID-19 will not be the last public health emergency. We must prepare better for the next. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ralph, and, and thank you to all of our, our speakers, um, you know, for, for presenting their views. Um, and I think overall, the, the, um, the main theme of this panel is, you know, how can we ensure open and connected supply chains of, of essential ICT goods um, in this crisis and in, in future crises? And I think, you know, overall from, from the remarks that international cooperation is very important, um, that, you know, being united as, as one voice, that's very important. Uh, and so it's just kind of how, how we can implement that. Um, so um, I know, I think we're about to enter the, the Q&A portion of, of this panel. Um, and I think, uh, you know, the overarching question, um, you know, that some of the panelists have, have um, sought to, to answer, but perhaps can, can offer more in depth is, you know, the specific steps that governments can take to, to maintain and, and strengthen 
open and connected supply chains. Um, so we've had some good, um, you know, feedback and recommendations, you know, but um, uh, I guess maybe I would just, uh, you know, turn um, to, to each uh, panelist in, in turn. I, I know that Ralph, that you had a good, good overview, um, but if you could just quickly summarize kind of some of the, the key steps um, uh, or the key uh, key actions that you would recommend, or you know, the number one uh, recommendation you would make to, to policymakers. That that's perhaps the the first question that I would ask each panelist. Uh, and um, uh, uh, then I'll, I'm starting to collect uh, questions from the audience, and after that, I'll turn to some of the audience questions. So with that, I guess maybe ask each in turn, Mary, Mario, and, and Ralph, if there was you know number one recommendation or top three for for policymakers. Um, on open and connected uh, supply chains, what would that be? Perhaps I can start with Mary. I think all three of us um, talked about um, tariffs, and uh, I know tariffs has been uh, uh, top of mind for for a lot of folks in industry over the past couple of years. Um, I, you know, I I, I can't uh, stress enough um, the importance of, of keeping tariffs low and eliminating tariffs on critical goods uh, and technologies. Um, you know, we all talked about the information technology agreement and uh, the expansion of, of the information technology agreement, um, and that's been great. Um, I think 80 plus countries are, are part of the original ITA and another 50 um, part of ITA expansion, but that's not the entire world um, and, and technology uh, uh, crosses borders into to countries that are not part of these agreements. So I would encourage um, those governments that have not taken steps to, to join these agreements to do so. Um, uh, and that, that would drastically lower uh, consumer costs and, and make technology more accessible. And, and you know, at, at a time where, where many of us are working from home, um, technology has is, is become even more important. It, it, it's enabling us to, to have this conversation today um, rather than, than flying into Geneva, um, which I would have liked to do, by the way. Um, you know, another thing, another thing that governments should look to do is, is increase uh, investments in supply chain resilience and their, um, their customs capacity, uh, things I touched on in, in my remarks. Um, so, so I'll stop there and, and um, hand it over to, to my colleagues uh, to offer their views. My patron to you next. Sure. Um, I just would continue on Mary's train of thought. I, I think the, the thinking about further multilateralism, thinking about how uh, working through the WTO and other um, regional uh, bodies to continue the, the, the introduction of trade facilitation measures, to continue the, the implementation of these measures. Um, I touched upon e economic operators in my remarks. Uh, single windows is another um, area where uh, interfacing through um, ICT networks um, helps improve um, the, the pace of customs clearance. Um, the, the introduction of, of, of risk-based approaches to customs clearance, again, connected to AEOs as well. Um, uh, manage, uh, rather than thinking about customs by transaction, is there a way for us to think of uh, customs tr transactions by account or importer? Uh, the ge geographic expansion of the ITA is also another uh, item. Uh, these the the duty free treatment we I, I touched upon one HS code but there are many uh, two dozen HS codes that um, that I, that are identified in the ITA that are beneficial to the ICT ecosystem that play a role in the the medical device assembly design develop manufacture right so you, not only do you have the end item but you also have the components the bill of materials of those items. Um, uh, being subject to duty free treatment, but also being able to move through customs very efficiently. Uh, I think that's important. You know, one thing this is one one thing that COVID has identified for us is just how important movement of goods is, and just how critical movement of goods is to how we respond 
uh, to these uh, to these emergencies. Um, and lastly, I, I will say is cooperation. I think dialogue, uh, dialogue among industry. Um, Mary and I both uh, represent companies that have uh, a global presence. Intel moves around 90 9,200 products. Uh, we we we're in 100 countries. So because of that cooperation and dialogue among companies, among industry associations, but also governments is important um, as we think of how we address um, the next, uh, our next reaction to pandemics, but also how we continue to connect our supply chains and ensure that we have very, very minimal disruptions. Thanks, Mario. And, uh, you know, Ralph, I know that you had had some detailed suggestions, but if you could just sum it up and kind of, you know, one of the main main suggestions for policymakers. Sure. And, uh, of course, I agree strongly with what Mary and Mario indicated. My main point is um, we need to restore trust relatively quickly. And like Mary, I spent a lot of time negotiating the GATT, the WTO, free trade agreements. And those can be, as Mary experienced in ITA, protracted negotiations. And one of the reasons is the requirement for unconditional MFN to get a critical mass. Uh, what we're suggesting is um, looking at a uh, conditional MFN for those countries willing to come together to eliminate tariffs, to uh, dig deeper into trade facilitation, um, they should get together. And I think the sooner the better that, that could happen because we don't know, one, how long this pandemic is going to last. Uh, the next shortage is likely to be vaccines and um, uh, the, the uh, needles and everything that's needed to, uh, um, uh, to, to, to administer the vaccines. There's probably other products that are needed. My point being that I don't think we have the luxury of waiting till the next public health emergency and then having governments come and cooperate and just talk about it. There needs to be uh, real action. So that's kind of a pile on message from what Mario and Mary said. Thank you. Thank you. Mary, you're on mute if you're speaking. Thank you. Thank you. I just I wanted to, to underscore what, what Ralph said about the time it takes to, to negotiate agreements. I mean, it, it's a years long process and anyone who's, who's worked at the WTO or, or participated in meetings there know that, that it takes time uh, to, to build alignment and agreement among uh, different countries at different development levels. Um, and so, I mean, we, we were, I think the entire world was, was caught flat footed by the COVID-19 pandemic, but, but now we're smarter and now we know we need to, to take uh, preparatory steps so that we're ready for the next big uh, disruption uh, and the next public health crisis. Um, so so, so to, to Ralph's point, you know, now is the time that we need to mobilize uh, and identify the problems and work cooperatively uh, in, you know, at the WTO, um, and, and other international forums uh, to address those uh, to address those uh, today's challenges and future challenges. And I'd say, um, you know, another another area where uh, I think there needs to be more discussion and global cooperation is is on data. Um, you know, I, one of the examples I highlighted uh, in my remarks was uh, you know connectivity and, and um, sharing medical data. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of barriers to the free flow of, of data across borders, and I think that's that's something that's been under the, under discussion at the WTO, uh, and I'd like to see that that accelerated, um, because uh, you know, free flow of data is also critical to uh, our manufacturing operations. Uh, we have design sites uh, all over the world, and they're uh, often in, in different places from our manufacturing sites. We need to send data. R&D information across borders, uh, and if governments, um, you know, keep continue taking, uh, you know, individual approaches to, to data management uh, and data security, uh, that's going to create more disruptions to uh, global supply chains as well. And if I just pile on Mary's comment about data, 
um, even get a little bit weedier. What we found in uh, we and the International Trade Commission and others is documenting trade flows, at least in the medical device area, is very difficult. The HTS was not set up you know, in the 70s and 80s when it was developed to track the types of products, at least that we manufactured. So something like an N95 mask, the ITC had to set up a separate HTS code, which it just did, to track N95 masks, so the respirators. So I would suggest maybe the WTO, they could look at the uh, HTS system too. Thanks for those comments. Um, I do have uh, one question um, from the audience um, from Iana Dreyer, a question for Ralph. Uh, the EU and the Ottawa Group are thinking about launching an initiative on trade and health goods at the WTO. How do you view this? Uh, and how is the USTR response so far to the proposals you made uh, to have a plurilateral on medical products? Well, um, in terms of the latter question, we put it in our uh, proposal, we haven't pushed it hard with USTR, so I don't know what their reaction would be. Um, in terms of an initiative, in terms of uh, uh, tariff-free for, for uh, health products, um, I'm old enough to have participated, well, first in the Uruguay round, if I care to admit that, but also in the Doha round, where the United States and I think about a half dozen other countries came up with a, an initiative for duty-free treatment for uh, medical devices and pharmaceuticals, which we have met strongly supported. So I've not seen the EU initiative. It sounds very encouraging. And uh, we work very closely with our sister association in Europe called MedTech Europe. So I would uh, appreciate getting more information on that and uh, coordinate with, the, uh, with our sister association. It sounds like a great initiative. Thank you. Thanks, Ralph, um, and, and hopefully that, that answered the, the question. Um, another question, just want to ask um, the panelists if, if they could just highlight to, to the extent that they're able, um, could you describe some of the key uh, supply chain challenges and how your company or companies uh, worked with policymakers to, to overcome them? Open to any of the, the panelists. Can you repeat the question? Can you, can you repeat Sorry. the question? Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, to the extent you're able. Um, you know, what were some of the key supply chain challenges in more detail from the from COVID nineteen, and uh, anything that your company or companies did to to work with policymakers to overcome them? Well, I, I can say you know can... one one challenge one challenge we had was just simply um, getting our workers. To um, you know, to our, our factories, to, to our um, facilities, and so we had to work, um, you know, just really on, on some really basic stuff, uh, logistics, um, and getting people to work. Uh, in some countries, um, we we had to um, house our our uh, employees in in hotels that were closer to um, closer to our facilities, um, uh, provide uh, transportation to and from. Um, to make sure that we were, were complying with the, with the government restrictions, um, you know, movement restrictions, um, as, as governments had imposed shutdown orders. Um, you know, so, so I mentioned sort of the, the distribution of, of worker passes, uh, making sure that we get, you know, that, that each of our workers gets the, the credentials that they need to show um, government, government officials that, that they are um, authorized to be uh, you know, out of their homes and, and going to work. So um, that was something that 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 took some time. Um, but again, you know, we we had uh, great um, uh, relationships with with the the local governments uh, where we operate. But but that that did take time. And so we'd like to see you know um, again uh, lessons learned and apply that to to future um, uh, crisis uh, management responses. Um, to make sure that that those types of logistics are in place uh, and moving quickly, so that we you know we don't have to wait um, you know days and, and in some cases weeks to to get our folks back to work. 
I'll add, Davey, I think the other area was just guidance, right? And I, and I think it was nice that we were able to get guidance from certain countries and have that guidance delivered to other governments and have dialogue with those governments to understand guidance, whether the guidance was coming from the United States, Japan, for example, um, Mexico, the Philippines, Malaysia. It's just guidance on how the semiconductor industry was deemed essential. Uh, Mary touched on employees, how the employees then uh, were what the working conditions in, in a factory, in a plant, et cetera, uh, were meeting certain guidelines in just ensuring uh, consistency. Um, and I think at the tail end of certainly when I think back in, in, the, in the, I wouldn't call in the heavy days of the pandemic of April and May, uh, March, it's just making sure that guidance was understood, guidance was delivered. Many governments weren't communicating guidance, so we, you know, we had to be that interlocutor, if you will, on ensuring that guidance was made. And also the associations, I think, SIA, and again, I mentioned several others, global associations also communicating, and those associations communicating guidance to government. Um, I think that was something where um, we had some challenges in the early days of the pandemic, but as time moved on, and we were able to, again, have those channels of communication established. We were able then to communicate guidance to ensure that there were no misunderstandings and also that um, governments weren't moving in the opposite direction, right, as, as, as um, infection rates were rising or, or um, there were questions about infection rates as well in our industry, right, and, and, dis and disaggregating our industry from potentially other manufacturing industries, because I think that was also something that was being communicated. Uh, we, we aren't like this, uh, the, the other manufacturing industries you touched upon, just how clean we are. I think communicating the, the cleanliness of some of these factories, the, these clean rooms are just cleaner than, than, than emergency theaters and, and surgical theaters, et cetera. I think that was also important. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. Um... Moving uh, to our, our next question, i um, to have, have an audience question, um, not uh, on COVID, but top of mind for a lot of, of folks. Um, the U.S.-China trade war um, is moving toward a tech war. How are U.S. export controls on semiconductors and equipment going to affect supply chains in the industry? Um, I know that this is not... Um, the, the exact topic of our, our panel, but Mari, Mario or Mary, would you be would you be willing to to uh, provide a response? I can I can start, um, and Mary, maybe you can help uh, fill in some gaps. Um, I think we have to disaggregate really when we talk about trade war, tech war, export controls. I, you know, I um, I think one of the myths is um, that semiconductors. Export controls on semiconductors are new. Export controls on semiconductors aren't new. Um, export controls on semiconductors have long been established, and there are rules around uh, the types of devices, their classification under the Export Administration regulations, and of course the end users of those of those devices. Um, the the movement of goods, the the supply chain of our semiconductors. Uh, regardless of, I think, what you hear in the news, uh, today remains um, fluid, right? I mean, market access is something that occurs. Companies like Intel come, I don't want to speak for Mary, but um, we continue to export our goods to customers around the world, and, and we certainly um, have to comply to regulations, and complying to regulations is critical and sometimes means obtaining export licenses. So for, for purposes of connecting back to the panel, um, our exports of semiconductors to the medical device manufacturers um, that AdvaMed and, and other associations um, uh, represent, I think uh, they continue and they continue to be uh, important to our value chain, but they're also, we have to be consistent, right? And we have to comply to rules and we could be complying to rules for years. So I, I don't I don't I don't I don't really see this as a, um, a it's not a clean connection. Um, I think export controls again are something that have been in, in, in 
around for a very long, long time. Uh, U.S. export controls aren't unique. The European Union has controls. Member states in Europe have controls. Uh, China's developing their own export control regime. So I, I think we have to sometimes be careful to kind of disaggregate these, these, these concepts from one another and, and really get down into more granular discussions about how they're applied. Yeah, I don't have too much more to add um, other than just to, to underscore uh, what Mario said um, that, you know, governments have been re regulating uh, the export of certain semiconductors and equipment um, and technology for a very long time. And this is something that, that TI um, has, has been, been um, you know, we, we've been complying with, with these uh, regulations for for decades, so it's 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 old hat for us. Um, so so yeah, and I think from from a medical device standpoint, um, we've you know as I said, we we've continued uh, shipping our products to to the customers that that um, are are developing uh, developing that life life saving equipment. Um, but again, it's it's not something that's that's new or foreign uh, to us as a company or as an industry. Thanks. Uh, thanks for those. Um, I do not have any other um, questions from from the audience. Um, so you know, I'll just ask uh, another question. Um, I think. You know, resiliency is the the new uh, catchphrase, new co you know, for for supply chains. Um, Ralph, you had you had mentioned um, you know working with policymakers to 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 build resiliency. I guess question for all panelists is you know what does a resilient supply chain look like to you, um, and what you know what how can policymakers support um, building this resiliency in the supply chains. So Ralph, you you had mentioned um, incentives. You're on you're on on mute, um, but just wondering what what that looks like, and if you could offer more more detail on that. Sure. Uh, well, the um, incentives that I mentioned are mainly for uh, reshoring, and if uh, government, the United States government, either this administration or another administration, wants to bring uh, manufacturing back. We're advocating um, positive incentives, uh, grants that uh, um, uh, um, would encourage manufacturing facilities, um, tax incentives. We want the government to focus on um, several elements, not just the physical facility, but research and development, um, training people. Uh, the training of people is just critical in our industry. The, uh, the uh, knowledge and expertise required to work in our industry is very, very important. So we want government to look more broadly than just um, some, uh, uh, if you're a manufacturing in China, you gotta get your manufacturing plant back in the United States, that, that, that just won't work. Um, in terms of resiliency, it also involves uh, recognizing that, uh, as I mentioned, our members tend to manufacture regionally and um, you're not gonna build a resilient supply chain by for example, insisting that all manufacturing, and I'm obviously being a little bit of an exaggeration, all manufacturing occur in Des Moines or something, or even in the United States, because something can happen to those, to those plants. We saw in Puerto Rico a year, uh, years ago, uh, a huge problem in Puerto Rico, that shut down uh, pharmaceutical and medical device plants that were basically in the customs territory of the United States. So this can occur throughout. So we believe uh, resiliency involves not just uh, looking at if you're putting your plan in the United States, but um, having um, uh, supply chains that have um, kind of backup components, if you will, not relying on a single source for for components. So uh, that's kind of a long-winded answer to I think a, a, a very very uh, important question. Thank you. You're on mute, Mary. That, that, that keeps happening. Sorry. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it, you know, just just to echo Ralph, I think um, positive incentives and and government investments in infrastructure, uh, in research and development, 
are all very important um, to, to build that, you know, build that, that capability. Um, I think uh, investing in, in people and education is, is critical to make sure that, you know, you have, you have the talent that you need, you know, the, a skills-based uh, workforce. Um, uh, you know, I, so, so again, government investments and incentives are an important piece of the puzzle. I'd say that mandates that would force dramatic changes to um, the global supply chain architecture um, and, you know, the institutions and, you know, trade commitments that support uh, that architecture um, or that undermine, you know, the, the principles of, of open commerce and fair competition and innovation-led growth would hamper, you know, the global public health response and the global economy. So I think, you know, looking at, at those um, positive, positive policies uh, that, that can help build, build that, that resilience and, and redundancy in the supply chain uh, are important and, and, and trying to avoid those, you know, mandates uh, that would force uh, companies to have to change, um, make costly changes to their, to their global supply chain operations. Thanks, Mary. Mara, did you want to add any comments on, you know, what resiliency, you know, would mean to, to, to Intel and, you know, what you would encourage policymakers to do to, to support resiliency in supply chains? Uh, I, I think uh, both Mary and Ralph covered covered uh, many of what I many of the items I would have said. I I will I would add though um, resiliency is you know we rely on predictable, enforceable, and and um, uh, supply chains right. And I and in, this, in the spirit of investment, in the spirit of um, the the ability to to take technology. Um, and, and implement technology in how governments introduced um, new customs procedures. Um, is there a way for, for governments, uh, when thinking about infrastructure, is there a way for governments to uh, introduce new technologies, whether it's artificial intelligence or machine learning, into their customs procedures and practices? Um, you know, resiliency also can, uh, it, it means that uh, continue the idea of duty-free treatment um, and, and the WTO moratorium uh, on duty-free electronic transmissions uh, is, is important as well for, for, for the introduction of technology into the, the way uh, governments clear goods from customs. Um, all of all of that being said is, you know, how do we continue the, the the introduction of capacity building and taking advantage of new technologies uh, in the in the realm of customs administration to ensure that customs administrations are keeping up with the pace of technology, taking advantage of technology where applicable, to ensure that security is look at looked out for, to ensure that duty free treatments looked out for, and ensure that the supply chain remains predictable, reliable, and efficient. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, I mean, this has all been very helpful. Um, I, I'm not seeing any further questions from uh, the audience. Um, and um, you know, I think that we've had a very good uh, open candid discussion on on uh, on steps that governments can take now, um, policymakers can take now and in the future. Um, so appreciate your views and, and uh, you know, highlighting um, your recommendations. Um, you know, I, just to, to sum up, you know, I think the theme across this is that, you know, we do need more international cooperation, um, that the WTO has been important um, and can continue to play an important role in preventing disruptions, um, you know, due to, to public health crises. Um, so you know, we look forward to continuing conversation with policymakers um, you know, eventually when, when folks are, are back in Geneva and can travel again and, and have face-to-face -face, uh, meetings. Um, but you know, for now, you know, we'll continue to, to support technology, the semiconductors and medical devices will we'll support the pandemic response and recovery. Um, happy to take any other questions. I do want to highlight that SIA will be coming out with a uh, paper, white paper soon, um, that on uh, semiconductors in medical devices, it's called from, from microchips to medical devices, uh, ensuring, um, you know, the supply chain of, of essential ICT goods that will um, capture some of the discussion here of the important role semiconductors play and will also capture some of the, the recommendations 
um, that we are making um, to um, you know, ensure uh, connected open supply chains. So please be on the lookout for that. Um, it, it'll be out in the next week or so. Uh, and as I mentioned, you know, SIA does have several resources um, on semiconductors and COVID. Uh, please check out our, our website at www.semiconductors.org uh, for more information. Again, that's semiconductors with an S.org. Uh, and feel free, feel free to reach out to, to me or some of my colleagues. You know, our contact information is on that website. Uh, again, I want to extend a very um, heartfelt thank you to the, the Geneva organizers uh, for putting this together and to Mario, Mary, and Ralph for participating in this panel. Uh, we appreciate your views and uh, um, thank you again to the audience as well for your questions. Uh, and we wish everyone um, you know, a good rest of the evening and, and that everyone stays safe and healthy. Thank you. Uh, so with that, I'll conclude the panel. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.